Hi again, everyone. I'm Mike King, along with Speedway historian Donald Davidson. We welcome you to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Hall of Fame Museum for another edition of Indy 500, The Classics. And today, Donald, we turn back the clock to 1980 and to a clear-cut, hands-down favorite. Yeah, there's no question about that. Al Unser had left the Jim Hall team, and Johnny Rutherford had been driving for McLaren for several years, and they decided at the end of 1979 they were going to concentrate on Formula One. So that left Johnny Rutherford at Liberty, and he hooked up with Jim Hall, and just about everybody said, hey, that's the winner. The two-time winner looking to make it three. Could he do it? Well, before he did, obviously, he had to qualify for the race. Let's take a look at practice and qualifying for the month of May, 1980. The date, Sunday, May 25th. The place, Indianapolis, Indiana. The event, the 64th running of the biggest spectator sports classic in the world. The Indianapolis 500. In just over three hours, one of these cars and drivers will roll into victory lane to the cheers of 380,000 fans. More than one-fourth of a million-dollar purse will be waiting, along with all of the fame and glory that traditionally goes to the winner of this, one of the oldest automobile races in the world. But automobile racing is not a one-on-one -on -one sport. It's the epitome of the team effort. The tremendous investment in labor and money makes victory all the more sweet. But it also makes failure all the more frustrating. The massive effort to run for the richest prize in racing usually has its beginning far from Indianapolis. parts of the country, two men pursue widely different interests. A ranch, automobiles, and an engine shop fascinates one, and the challenge of business community needs and politics motivates the other. This unlikely pair, Jim Gilmore of Kalamazoo, Michigan, and A.J. Foyd of Houston, Texas, form one of the closest partnerships in racing. And once a year, they come to Indianapolis to become partners at 200. At Indianapolis, there are other partners at 200. Johnny Rutherford depends on car owner Jim Hall and mechanic Steve Roby. His wife Betty and his family give him the confidence that every race driver must have to be a winner. That's the way it is in auto racing, for while the driver sits in the car alone, the advice and expertise of his partners follows him like a shadow, even at 200 miles per hour. And so it begins, as it does every year early in May at Indianapolis take the first exploratory practice runs to determine what can be a winning speed combination. And with the cars and drivers come the fans. There's something very special about a race driver. Perhaps it's the image of a tall hero with a flashing smile who flirts with danger at 200 miles per hour and then finds time to sign autographs or pose for a picture with the newest member of the family. drivers, 24 of them, a bumper crop for 1980. Tony Bettenhausen, his father and brother, both racers. Dana Carter, his father, a veteran contender. Removing the rookie stripes after passing their test, now they're eligible to try and win a place in the 500 field. are not confined to new drivers. Gordon Johncock is the 1973 winner, and he has a fractured left ankle. It's the first day of qualifying. Tim Richmond, a popular rookie, hits the wall in practice. 
He was clocked at 190 miles per hour just before the crash. First out, the 1979 defending champion, Rick Mears of Bakersfield, California. Four quick trips around the Indianapolis Oval, and he's in the race with an average of 187.490. Janet Guthrie, her fourth year. Her speed of 184 plus is not the 185 she and her partners agreed on, so she takes a wave off and will try again. Tom Sneva, 185.290. Mario Andretti, 191 plus. Johnny Parsons, wait a minute. That helmet comes from 30 years back, and so does the driver. Sitting in his winning car, he remembers well the rainy afternoon in May of 1950 when he wrote his name in the record book. It's hard to realize it's been 30 years since I won the 500. Back in 1950, some of the names were the same as today. Bettenhausen, Vukovic, and Carter. Back then, you fought the heavy steering wheel for 500 miles. You had to visually check your tires every lap, read the signboard, and signal back to your crew. Check your gauges and concentrate on getting on and off the bricks on the main straightaway. As you came off the pavement onto the bricks, the rear end always wanted to pass the front. It was rough. The day I won the race, my mechanic, Harry Stevens, found a crack in the engine block. Nothing to be done but drive and hope she'd last. That engine was still running strong when the rains came. Well, Johnny Parsons is still racing. Johnny Parsons Jr., that is. 187.412. That's 55 miles an hour faster than my 1950 qualifying speed. Yes, sir. That's my boy. Rutherford won the 1974 and the 1976 Indianapolis 500. Right now, it's first things first. Get in the race, win the pole. 192.256 ought to do it. Bobby Unser is in with 189.994. Roger Rager, another of the 1980 rookies, makes it with 186 plus. Racing requires a total team effort. And since 1973, the team of A.J. Foyt and Jim Gilmore has been one of the most successful in championship races. In that time, A.J. has rolled the Gilmore banner into victory lane 23 times, including one of the most memorable in the history of the Indianapolis Speedway. That was in 1977, when A.J. became the first driver to win the May Classic four times. In 1979, Foyt was second to Rick Mears, rolling across the finish line with a dead engine. Now at 5.59 p.m., one minute before the deadline of the first day of qualifying, A.J. Foyt puts the famous Gilmore Foyt number 14 into the race. It is characteristic of Foyt's racing strategy that he would wait until conditions were to his liking rather than try in mid-afternoon when the wind is a danger and the track is slow. As it is, he'll start 12th in the field of 33. Midweek, Tom Sneaver practices in his already qualified car. unhurt, his car is destroyed. He'll drive another car on race day, but the rule book says he must start last. The rains come, the rains go. It's May 18th, the last day to qualify. Rick Muther tries, but time runs out for him. AJ looks to see who's left. Tim Richmond is in with another car. George Snyder puts a second Gilmore Foyt racer in the field. So who do they interview? Foyt, of course. Rain and hail, the moments 
drift away for Janet Guthrie and a long line of hopeful contenders. And then it's over. Janet experiences the bitter frustration of not qualifying for her fourth Indianapolis race. So qualifying is complete, and Donald, no surprises in 1980. Jim Hall Chaparral with Johnny Rutherford at the wheel is sitting on the inside of row one. But Tom Stever starting 33rd in a row uh, that nobody knew was in there, and they had the accident in practice and was allowed to substitute another car and start last, and that was the first time that that had ever been done. The front row of Johnny Rutherford, Mario Andretti, and Bobby Unser will bring the field to the green flag for the 1980 Indianapolis 500. before, but from that usually undistinguished 11th starting row will come the second, third, and eighth finishers for the 1980 Indianapolis 500. second, Mario Andretti third, Rick Mears fourth. The field strings out as veteran and rookie driver alike try to employ winning strategies developed with their partners before the race. Rutherford knows by radio communication with his crew chief what everyone in the race is doing. He knows, for instance, that Mike Mosley is smoking and slowing down. That Larry Cannon is coasting into the pits with a broken camshaft. But beyond that, he knows that anything can happen at any time, and that comes from years of experience. Mass confusion in the 10th lap. Dick Ferguson hit the wall. Bill Whittington hit the wall. Both rookie drivers. Whittington scrapes to a stop. The nose of his car is gone, and he has a fractured ankle. But in an instant, he became older, wiser, and a veteran. 
the yellow, everyone heads for the pits. It's good team strategy to fill the tank when the field is running slow. Another rookie, but this one is leading the race. Roger Rager is in front for two laps, the 16th and 17th. Then comes in for his first service stop. Jim Gilmore watches as George Snyder takes the lead on the 18th lap. Then Gordon Johncock passes, but Pancho Carter is breathing down his neck. Foyt is running a comfortable seventh. Three-time winner Al Unser is out with a bad cylinder. Pancho Carter claims the lead for the 36th to the 39th lap. Ben Rutherford passes and is in front again. Johnny Parsons Jr. is slowing down. What a story that would have made, winning the 500 30 years after his death. Mario Andretti leads. Jim McElreath hits the wall as others take wild evasive action. From another angle, you can see that a number of cars were lucky to avoid McElreath's car, but Roger Rager, heading for the comparative safety of the infield, was unable to get it gathered up again and parked his car against the tunnel wall. Andretti slowing down with engine failure. It's the 72nd lap. Andretti is in. Rutherford leads with Bobby Unser second. A.J. Foyt is still in the top ten. Haywood spins at the beginning of the main straightaway and heads for the pit. In the pits, Tom Sneva makes a 13-second stop after leading the race for 11 laps. When the green flag comes out, Bobby Unser leads with Tim Richmond second. Dick Simon has lost a wheel and incredibly continues on around the track to his pit. Bobby Unser is out. Lap 127. A.J. Foyt is in on the 130th lap. Here is teamwork. The Gilmore Foyt crew service him and send him on his way in 13 seconds. hits the wall in turn one. Danny Ongaias makes a nine-second stop in the 133rd lap. Bobby and Marsha Unser watch as Rutherford passes Tom Steva in the 148th lap to take the lead for the sixth time in this race. Rick Mears passes Danny Ongaias. Mears is third. In lap 170, Foyt is running ninth. And then he's slowing down, coming into the pits. Veteran mechanic Howard Gilbert and Jim Gilmore watch anxiously as Foyt comes to a stop. He's finished for this race. But when you've been together as a team for seven years, you understand that a high average performance is ultimately what pays off. So next year, there will likely be another Gilmore Foyt entry and another try for the big prize. Still, it would have been nice if teammate George Snyder could have finished, but he's out too. Rick Mears tours the track out in front. makes his last pit stop. He'll have to go 28 laps non-stop to beat Mears, who comes in on the 179th lap. The laps roll into the record book. Rutherford holds the lead. Behind him is Tom Sneath, Gary Bettenhaus, Gordon Johncock, and Rick Mears. There's the white flag, and now begins the longest lap in the race. It's only two and a half miles, why does it take so long? And why does Johnny Rutherford think he can hear the loud beating of his heart above the roar of his end? There it is, 
that checkered flag that Johnny Rutherford, Jim Hall, and Steve Roby have sought so diligently. It took Johnny a while to come around. It seems that Tim Richmond ran out of fuel, so Rutherford stopped to give him a ride. Richmond, finishing ninth, said, if you can't win, then ride in with the winner. it's all about. It's like winning the biggest jackpot at Las Vegas. It's like seeing your name in lights on Broadway. It's like standing on the top of the highest mountain. For whatever it is that motivates men to achieve is the magic spark that has brought this 42-year-old racing veteran from Fort Worth, Texas into the Indianapolis winner's circle for the third time. For all those close to him, the victory is shared. For no man, no driver, can hope to give his best unless his partners also dedicate themselves to the maximum effort that it takes to win. Tom Sneva came from 33rd to 2nd. Gary Bettenhausen, the slowest qualifier, is 3rd, but he feels like he's won. Mears, last year's champion, is fifth this time, but he's greeted like a winner by a young lady named Dina, whose last name also happens to be Mears. Gordon Johncock drove to fourth with a cast on his foot, and Danny Angaias finished seventh behind Pancho Carter. You'll remember that Johnny Rutherford gave Tim Richmond a ride on his car as he came to Winter Circle? Well, Tim would probably be happy to do as much for John next year. So Donald 1980 ended uh, pretty much the way it began with uh, Johnny Rutherford expecting to be in victory lane, and certainly he was. And of course that was quite a moment uh, as he stopped to pick up Tim Richmond, uh, who would run out of fuel and bring him down to victory lane. But great run by Tom Sneaver and also Gary Battenhausen, who didn't even expect to finish the race in a four-year-old car. In fact, he told his wife and kids, he said, be ready when I drop out, be ready because we're going to leave the track and beat the rush home. He didn't think he was going to last 500 miles. Well, for Johnny Rutherford, his third win here at the Brickyard as he celebrates in Victory Lane in 1980. For Donald Davidson, I'm Mike King. We hope you'll join us again next time for another edition of Indy 500, The Classics.